gives me great pleasure as one of the co-organizers, sorry, the junior co-organizer of this meeting, I should say, to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, uh, Marianne Felix from Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. And um, Marianne's been working on uh, all the aspects of nematology that we all love. She's worked on uh, the evolution of development. She's worked on um, looking at discovery of new species and the diversity of those species in the wild. She's been working on ecology. You've already heard her name mentioned several times, several talks already. And also discovering new species of Cynorhabditis um, around the world. So it's um, an easy choice for our, our platform speaker this evening. So uh, please welcome Marianne Felix, who's going to talk about natural populations of Cynorhabditis and their phenotypic variation. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm not going to cover everything tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, so first of all, um, I think especially in the Seligans community, a part of us, uh, many are ready to believe that uh, Seligans N2 was created on the third day and a half by Sidney Brenner, and that it was placed by him in the garden of the Petri dish to feed an OP50 uh, forever and live happily. <laughs> so I think part of what we as a community are trying to do is both to, to show that uh, C. elegans N2, there, is, there are some variation around it, um, and, and the variational properties of the species and the species around um, are important, um, and also that the Petri dish is not the natural environment and that it may be interesting to know uh, what's the actual natural environment. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, as you may know, I've been trying to isolate uh, Cynorhabditis for many years, and I think it's a job for undergrads and PIs, it seems. Um, so it's very simple, <laughs> it's the bottom line. Um, so the way we do it in the lab um, from the first, um, uh, when, uh, when Antoine Barrière was in the lab, uh, quite a few years ago now, uh, we put the samples on the Petri dishes that are so well known for C. elegans uh, in the lab with E. coli and the worms come out. And we can actually, within hours of sampling, uh, determine their stage and then pick them and establish strains uh, if we wish. But the advantage of this is that we actually get uh, the stage of the worms in the populations right away. Um, so I must say that I started in Paul Sternbach's lab in 1994 and like the week I arrived in the lab, we started sampling soil in Pasadena. And we tried to find Cynorhabditis, and we found a lot of Oshayos and a lot of other things, but no Cynorhabditis for years and years and years because people were telling me, not Karin, apparently inventor, but the others, that C. elegans was <laughs> a soil name method. And uh, after uh, seven years of desperation, uh, with Antoine, we started uh, getting compost, which was not extremely satisfactory because uh, it's artificial, but then we could actually get natural population of C. elegans and get some diversity here. But if you look at the papers from that time, we were finding 100% or 95% of the hours in this population. Okay, so where does C. elegans actually feed and reproduce was the question. Uh, and it took a few more years that um, we found out that rotting fruits were a very rich source. And I think the reason for this is that you actually, as Buck was mentioning earlier, you have to find, to look at many fruits before you find it. So probably the first attempts were not uh, successful, and I just, okay. But in rotting fruits, we definitely find proliferating populations, and as you know, we found many new spe species of Cynorhabditis that way around the world. More recently, because I was quite frustrated that in f mainland France, rotting fruits are mostly uh, cultivated species, uh, I, um, and also because I had found, I think, in the tropics, banana pseudostems to harbor large populations, I started to, to sample uh, stems of um, plant species, like herbaceous, herbaceous, sorry, not woody stems, uh, which rot at the base of the stem, and there too I can find proliferating po populations which are a more natural environment, obviously, than you know, artificial apple orchards. Um, and so right now, the, the places where I can find proliferating populations of uh, C. elegans and as C. briggs as well are rotting fruits and rotting stems of various species. Um, as you may know, we also find uh, C. elegans and C. briggs and C. remani and uh, several of these elegans group species associated with invertebrates. Um, 
isopods especially, and these are, as, as far as I can tell, dower stages. Uh, but I must say that recently I found um, worms which were not in the dower in slugs and snail uh, as well. So uh, apart from this last exception, which I don't know much about, um, the, the, when we look in the stems and the fruits, uh, and these are just two examples, I have you know, dozens of populations like this, you can look at the census of the population and make an index on a log scale, uh, so zero for zero, one between one and ten, and so on. And then you can stage the developmental stage of the, of the worms. And for example, this population is typically a proliferating population, so you don't have any dowers or L2Ds. Now you can have other populations which look like they are really massively entering into dower, where the worms are either adults, L1, L2D, and dowers. Uh, and this is always the case on populations which have a large um, census size. Uh, so the, the way we can think about these populations, even though I, I've never followed one over time, uh, is that you have dowers which uh, migrate into one of these rich source of food, and in some cases uh, they, uh, they exit dower and they start reproducing, and after the population is large, and large is, depends probably uh, on, on the, some properties of the, 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 the habitat here, they enter dower. And then, as you may know, the dower has a specific nictating behavior, and that may be uh, used uh, to um, climb on one of these um, larger invertebrates that themselves live in these habitats. Uh, I mean, you, you find a lot of slugs and snails in, in fruits and isopods also in the rotting stems. Uh, and, and the cycle can start again. So nictation is something uh, which is pretty amazing. So here you see a single dower nictating on its tail. Here you have a small groups of dower and very often they like to nictate on the, on the tip, a pointed tip of something. But you can also find when there are many dowers around, this huge group of dowers, and uh, if the movie functions, I'll show you uh, a movie of this. So what you're seeing here, here, each of those is a dower, but the whole mass, all this is dowers, and this goes down here. All these are dowers, which are on, a, on an apple here, a rotting apple, and so the whole mass here uh, in, a, in a group is nictating. Um, and so you may imagine if this is really um, a way to be carried away by a invertebrate that not all of them are going to be carried away. So it's some kind of, I mean, the comparison with like dictostelium mass is, is a little extreme, but um, that it's a, some kind of social behavior. We'll see. Okay, now the points I want to make is uh, the detailed studies I've been carrying in France uh, where I really find that C. elegans and C. briggsae cohabit. Uh, and this uh, is pretty amazing. So all these uh, samples that I told you about, I find exactly C. elegans and C. Briggsay the same, and sometimes in the same sample actually mixed. So this is a map of France, and, and the dots, uh, the colors represent the different species. Elegance and Briggsae are everywhere. The exception is the west of France, um, where I could only find elegance so far, and the east of France, where uh, you start having C. Remanae. And then I find, found a new species in Orsay um, a couple of times. So what I did more precisely was in Orsay, in this apple orchard that Buck showed you, uh, I sampled over four years at many different time points during each year. Uh, and then I, I looked at 25 apples per time point and look at the proportion of apples which are plotted here, which are either zero in blue or uh, going towards red, more and more worms into them. So either C. elegans or C. breezy. What, what you're seeing is that for C. elegans, they tend to increase during the fall, peaking uh, late in November, even December here. Um, and th that there is no C. elegans in summer, and it drops uh, after December. Whereas Briggsae is um, present in summer and then drops earlier than C. elegans uh, by November. Okay? So there seems that the two species, uh, there is a seasonal pattern here between the two species with elegans uh, arriving later in the year than Briggsae. Um, this obviously may have a correlate with temperature. So in, in France, summer is hot and fall, the late fall is cooler. 
Uh, and if you look at the world distribution of the two species, you may notice that Briggsae is everywhere in orange, but elegance is mostly in the temperate areas. And it may be that those dots in the tropical areas are mostly in altitude. Um, uh, so one hypothesis is that uh, there is a temperature preference for the two, which is uh, true in the lab, like as most of you may know. Uh, but this was tested more um, rigorously by uh, Fabien Duvaux in the lab, who took um, a strain of C. elegans and a strain of C. Briggsae from Orsay and the same from Santeuil, another location and competed them in the lab uh, in five replicates at three different temperatures. So starting with uh, 10 L4 larvae of each. And you have, uh, what is clear is that there is a strong effect of temperature and uh, C. elegans winds at low temperature. This is a proportion of Briggsae. Uh, and also uh, uh, C. L uh, C. Briggsae winds, uh, it gets completely, uh, it, uh, it totally outcompetes uh, C. elegans after a certain number of uh, transfers of the populations at 27. And at 21, there is a genotype effect between the two. Yeah. Um, so the, it's the, sorry. So it is, uh, the, the seasonal patterns and the world distribution may be at least in part explained by the temperature preferences uh, of the two species. So the way they may share the same habitat in France, for example, is that they actually are a succession uh, during the season with an overlap uh, in some season, in, 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 fall, in the fall. So just uh, this is published uh, at the end of last year, but we, we now have isolated uh, with the help of many people, um, many uh, new species from uh, around the world. Uh, some of them are very specific to an area, like species 5. Uh, some are pretty cosmopolitan, like species 11, the third hermaphroditic species in red here, which is all over the tropics. And uh, some of them still come up uh, in, in temperate areas, so it's well possible to find new sp species really uh, in your backyard, I think. Uh, and some areas of the world are totally undersampled, so please keep sampling. Uh, and I think up to now we are, tw I, I don't know, species 25 or something, uh, right? Um, so it, it's, we still have many, many more species to come and this is a great resource for many of us. As you may know, I think a very interesting group which is coming uh, is the group around Briggsae and the other issue is that we still don't have the sister species uh, here, uh, but we have a lot of uh, new interesting species uh, all around. Okay, so what's also important in the ecology of the worms, besides temperature and the environment, is, is in the environment are, are other organisms, and they may be, they may be uh, interacting with C. elegans in many ways, and here I will talk more um, about uh, food and pathogens, let's say. Um, so what you find in the gut of wild-caught worms is a lot of things. It's not at all empty like uh, M2 gut on uh, OP50, and you have a wall flora, and sometimes it gets to the point that is actually blocking any flow in the intestine. So this I would call it a pathological uh, state. But in sometimes it looks re relatively healthy. And then you have some bacteria which are clear pathogens. So I've isolated a few uh, that, uh, Locobacter species that Jonathan Hodgkin studies, which are, um, have similar um, symptoms and pathogenic effect as uh, microbacterium. Um, and then I have this, this one I isolated recently. It's a really deadly bacteria that heats up even the cuticle of the worm and it only proliferates on the, on the NGM OP50 plate uh, where the worm was, so it feeds off the whole carcass of the nematode. So this is a horror show for just two minutes. Um, so these are fungi, so you have the trapping fungi that you probably heard about. So where the worms can enter and then the traps actually contract and then uh, they send hyphae inside the worms and it's all, they eat up totally the worm. You have the other fungi which use spores for entering the worms, so things like drachmeria that have been studied in uh, Jonathan Eubank's lab, um, which adhere to the cuticle on the outside, to the vulva or the mouth, for example, or things like arbosporium uh, which has been characterized by Nathalie Pujol, um, uh, which enters through the intestine and at the end also colonizes the worm. 
You have microsporidia, which are uh, eukaryotic parasites, obligate parasites, which infect uh, cells intracellularly, and in this case, uh, the intestinal cells, which are the first cells uh, when you eat something uh, that get attacked. Uh, and this is a very frequent natural infection that I'm seeing. And these microsporidia so far are all horizontal transmission. And then came an interesting um, symptoms uh, where I could not see any pathogens, but I could cure the culture and then reinfect it by uh, exposing with sick worms. But I could not see any pathogens, so the idea was that this could be a virus, and after point to micron filtration, the symptoms could still be uh, transmitted. Um, so in collaboration with David Wong uh, at WashU, uh, we found uh, three now um, viruses uh, which infect uh, C. elegans or C. brixae, and each of them may be specific for a species. So the Orsay virus, named after the place I found it, uh, infect C. elegans and Santay and Leblanc brixae. And they have the same genomic structure with three open reading frame, a polymerase, a capsid, and a uh, off of unknown function. They are related to Noda viruses by the capsid and the polymerase, but this doesn't exist in the other Noda viruses of arthropod and fish. Uh, so this, this is now being used by several labs to study uh, immunity against viruses and especially the role of the small RNA response and RNAi. On the evolution and ecology part, uh, one of the interesting things is the, the species specificity that seems to be the case for, for each of the three viruses, and also the fact that within C. elegans, there is a wide variety of uh, sensitivity to the virus to, of the different wild isolates. So this was looked at by Tony Bellica, a student in the lab, who took the 97 wild isolates uh, defined by the, the paper from um, Eric Anderson et al. from the Coglia Club uh, to be able to do genome-wide association in C. elegans. And what you see here is on the log scale is the viral load of the RC virus after infection. Um, the, the original strain I isolated in, which is sensitive to the virus, is up here. N2 is here. It's not very sensitive. There is worse than N2. It can carry a little bit of virus. Um, but you have a whole distribution. Then when you do um, a genome-wide association, what you find is a significant peak on chromosome 4. This is a very, very wide peak, which uh, about 6 me megabase, so we haven't yet broken it down. Uh, Tony is doing that uh, at the moment. W if you look at this haplotype plot in, in the anderson gerker shapiro et al. paper, so this is a plot where you have the chromosome 4 here, the physical map here, and the isolates, and the colors correspond to identity, so red is like N2. Um, and basically here there are three types of, on this middle of chromosome 4, you have three types of, of haplotypes. You have the N2, all red. You have the ones looking like GU1580 with this uh, green and orange block. And then you have uh, exotic, blue, pink, something else. Uh, and basically, the, all the, the, the strains which tend to be sensitive are those with this GU1580, hence this signal uh, in the previous slide. But you still have some, some which are uh, sensitive in the pink ones, suggesting that there may be, uh, which, which don't have at all the, the same SNPs, which suggests that there may be more than one region to be sensitive within the species. More, I mean, variation is not only um, at one locus. Um, surprisingly, so, so far we don't know more about uh, what the locus is, but just with this data, we can plot, and there seems to be a, a geographic distribution. Uh, there is some signal in the overall data, but on this chromosome 4 center, um, this GU1580 haplotype is basically European and African, and is not found at all uh, in North America and the few strains from Australia and Japan. I don't, I'm not sure what this means, but this is remarkable because there are not so many, uh, I mean, there seems to be a structure here, a geographic structure. Okay, so now I'd like to go to the second part, which is quite distinct, which is our work on uh, evolution of vulva development. And I've chosen to, to try to summarize, because we don't have at the moment very much um, unpublished data, to summarize the work which has been done in the lab over many years, but uh, to try to put it together on the idea of mutational bias um, 
uh, and the relationship between genotypic variation and phenotypic variation because I think uh, this may be a, a one important point um, of uh, the, the way we can use C. elegans basically and mutation accumulation and experimental evolution to address key questions in evolutionary biology. So the, the question I'd like to address tonight is, um, so in, in evolution there are two main uh, forces which may have a, a key role in phenotypic evolution. One is obviously natural selection, uh, but natural selection is acting on existing variants at the phenotypic level. Um, and the mapping of genotype to phenotype being very complex, there still, there, there already may be biases as to the, the type of phenotypic variation you have just by the fact that when you explore genotype randomly, uh, phen the phenotypic space is not explored randomly. So you may have some, some phenotypes which are difficult to, to change uh, and to explore by random mutation or recombination. Um, and some others which are much easier to explore and in this direction it may be biased one way versus the other. So how can you actually uh, look at this experimentally? Um, mutation accumulation lines are a great tool for this uh, and this has been developed by uh, Charlie Baer and Michael Lynch um, in many different uh, experiments but this is one precise experiment from Charlie where he took uh, two genotypes of Briggsay and two genotypes of C. elegans and then develop uh, mutation accumulation lines for 250 generations. So in this case, you just accumulate random mutation uh, in the lab without much selection because you pick a, a single worm every generation. So what you can ask at the end is what is the phenotypic um, spectrum and, and the quantitative phenotypic spectrum you get for uh, your phenotype of interest. So our phenotype of interest or of study is, is uh, vulval cell fates. So I won't um, give you a course on the vulva, but just uh, know that there are six vulva precursor cells and um, they acquire different fates. So they are color coded with four different possible fates here. The blue or primary, the red or secondary, the yellow or tertiary, and then P3P can adopt uh, even in N2, two possible fates depending on the individual, the gray, which is not part of the group of competent cells, or the yellow, like P4P and P8P. So if you look without mutation accumulation uh, at many uh, worms, uh, you can, or even looking at mutants if you want, but uh, you can find development, developmental variants. So you can find variants where you have an incomplete vulval fate pattern, so less induction. Uh, to the extreme, it may be all yellow. Uh, hyperinduction, so the induced cells are the red and blue, uh, like this, or, or, or so on. So this we call class A. These are really incomplete vulvas. B is the complete pattern with a 2-1-2, a red, blue, red, uh, but this may be uh, centered, uh, instead of being centered on P6P here, it may be centered more anteriorly or more posteriorly, or you may have cells missing. This is the B class. Uh, altered yet complete. Then the C class is when P4P and P8 may, may start doing like P3P often does. And then the D class, which is not even a var I mean, it's, it's such a common variant that it has a, it, it's really, it's already up there in the canonical pattern. But uh, we call this a D class. So you can look uh, over time in this mutation accumulation lines at the rate, the per generation change in variant phenotype frequency compared to control lines. And you, you turn out to have what will be important in this uh, very complicated graph is the, the scale on the y-axis. You have um, here uh, those w which evolve at very low rates, so 10 to the minus 5, if you want. Um, Whereas this one's, it's 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2. Okay, and it's even more because. Um, so the, basically the A and B change, mutate, the phenotypic variation, the mutational variance is very low. This one, the C class, it's much higher and the D class is even one or two logs higher than the C class, okay. Um, so this tells you that if you look at the different type of cell fate pattern changes and these cells in principle are equivalent, the, the different uh, fates don't change at all at the same rate if you mutate them at random. 
So P3P is by far the most sensitive cell. And nicely, uh, this corresponds to developmental work that you can do, which is to ask for each of these changes, how do you get it develop developmentally? And how sensitive are these changes to changes if you can manipulate? So for example, P3P turns out to be um, a very sensitive to a gradient of winds which comes from the posterior side of the animal, as shown in the Korswagen slab. And if you take, so there are two winds which are expressed posteriorly, and if each of them, if you take a heterozygote, the wild type of other null, a heterozygote, so you have the dose of one of them, uh, and then you already have an effect on the division frequency of P3P here in gray. So this is the homozygous, heterozygote, N2. Um, and this is the same with the other winds. So each of these two redundant winds, if you have one of them, you already have uh, here an effect on P3P. So it's really a cell which is extremely sensitive to, to variation. Um, so the B class, which is mostly changing the centering, is explained by the fact that the cell which induces the primary fate has some variance in its positioning. Uh, whereas the fates, the induction of primary and secondary, um, you have, no, sorry, I'm, it's <laughs> backward, um, are, are happening uh, very rarely, and this you can correlate to the fact that if you change the EGF dose, for example, the EGF gene, unlike the wind genes, is aprosufficient. If you have half the dose, um, everything goes okay. Um, so the, this mechanistic, basically, uh, system properties uh, may explain this different uh, class of mutational variants um, for the different traits. Sorry. There are more things you can uh, get from these MA line uh, studies is to do the comparison between the MA lines, the, the, the frequency of variants in the mutation accumulation lines with those you find in wild isolates. So in quantitative genetic term is comparing the mutational variance with the standing genetic variance on the phenotype. And from this, um, so these are calculations from Charlie Baer, uh, you can derive approximate uh, um, coefficient of selection on the different traits. The, the important thing is that they are very strong on these classes, A and B, uh, mild on C, and you cannot detect any selection, so it's consistent with P3P evolving neutrally. It doesn't sh show it, but it's consistent. And uh, remarkably, so this means that these ones, we didn't see many variants in the MA lines, but these variants were still much, much more frequent than in the wild isolates. Otherwise, we wouldn't have detected uh, this difference. So here in this system, at least, and I don't know in general this may be, the least easily obtained variants are also the most selected again. Another interesting aspect of using these MA lines is, uh, as uh, you may remember, that Charlie started with two strains of C. Bruxae and two of uh, C. elegans. And when you analyze the data taking these genotypes into account, you can, for each of these traits and each of these species or the strain, uh, look if there is an interaction between the two. And yes, there is. So this means, uh, depending on the species, and this is, for example, clear here or here, you get a lot more variance in Briggsae for these two traits than in C. elegans. And the overall analysis gives you a significant p-value. And even within a species, if you look at strain within a species, you also have uh, a signal. And for example, here, uh, in one of the strains of C. elegans, you get more hyperinduction variant than in the other. So this suggests that depending on the genotype you're starting with, the phenotypic spectrum you're getting at by random mutation is different. So in other terms, it means that the, the mutational variance itself evolves. Okay. So is this important uh, in, uh, in the longer term in evolution? Uh, so then we can look, and this is work that was done in collaboration with uh, Karin Kionke and David Fitch, um, was to plot on the phylogeny of rabdatids now developmental traits, the same way as Karin showed you for, for morphological traits, developmental traits such as uh, the fate of these cells. So what you're seeing here plotted on the phylogeny of rabdatids um, is uh, the P3P division frequency. So remember P3P was the trait evolving fastest, fastest in the mutation accumulation lines of C. elegans and C. Briggsae. 
And what you see is that, so the color code is um, the division frequency, and this changes a lot in the family, but overall very much in serum diatis. And I'd like you to compare with this other genus here, Oshaius, where it doesn't change at all. Okay. Uh, now, the second one, which in uh, sinoabditis was not, um, the mutational variance was lower than P3P, was P4P and P8P division. And you see that uh, on the evolutionary tree of actual evolutionary change, it doesn't change in sinoabditis, uh, but it does change in Oshaius. Okay. Uh, so here, when we ask, so is the mutational variance in Oshaius different from that of sinoabditis? I don't have a very clean answer with mutation accumulation lines, but um, here is what I have. So in C. elegans, we know from MA lines that this is much easier to change than this. And this correlates with the natural variation if you look at the number of wild isolates with different division frequency of P3P versus P4P. Whereas in Oshaya stipule, we had a lot, done a lot of EMS screens and screen for variation in, in the cell lineage of these cells. And it was very easy to find, uh, I mean, it was actually the main cl class of mutants was to find variation in P4P and P8P. And this also correlates with natural variants um, that are very frequent. Um, so the, the, the tantalizing conclusion here is that this, the, this change in mutational variance can result in the difference in evolutionary tendency between the different species or genera. Yeah. Uh, said in other uh, terms here, in the Oshaius, P3P is invariant and P4P and P8P vary. In Cerebditis, it's the converse. And if I come back to this uh, representation I had earlier, you can imagine that if this is uh, C. elegans, for example, here um, you are here in genotype space. After random mutation, your phenotype may extend in this direction and be quite constrained here, extend in P3P and be constrained for P4P. Whereas for another genotype, and this may be Oshaius, uh, it is much easier uh, compared to C. elegans to change P4P and P8P by random mutation. So here, uh, this is suggesting that this is obviously selection is important as well, but one has to take into account the mutational variance, the, the bias that on the phenotype, phenotypic change, that mutation uh, is applying on the system and that this may be relevant to phenotypic evolution. And moreover, that this may explain the evolution of this bias may explain the evolution of evolutionary trends. So in conclusion, uh, this, uh, if you compare the mutation accumulation lines with actual wide isolates, you can detect the action of selection uh, and show in this case that uh, the volval fates are under a stabilizing selection. Um, you can show that the different vulva traits, so for example, the cell lineage and the fates of each of the different cells vary at different rates upon mutation. So the mutational variants differ in, for the different cells. Uh, the most variable one being P3P, and it is at the mechanistic level extremely sensitive to variation uh, in the wind pathway, for example. And finally, and I think importantly, this relative mutational variance of these different cells itself evolves, and this may partially explain evolutionary trends um, in the system. So yeah, I'd just like to end uh, and thank the people who, of the lab and past members, because this was the work of many people. So I talked about the virus uh, project with Tony. Uh, Fabien did the competition experiments between Elegance and Brigze. Uh, Christian did uh, all the scoring of the MA lines and the collaboration um, with Charlie. And these are the many people who I really like to thank for great collaborations uh, over time for many aspects of what I talked about. Thank you. So, questions for Hi, I'll ask a question you, you might probably don't have an answer for yet, but you often surprise us. So, uh, beautiful work with the um, bias and constraints in uh, vulval development between Oshias and Cinerabditis. 
there's a couple different mechanisms by which these underlying patterns could then become fixed in different species. You might imagine that different patterns of variation will give different chances of being fixed by um, genetic drift. Or alternatively, if, if species has a certain pattern of variation but is exploring a wide variety of environments, you know, suddenly they'll find an environment where one of these things works. And so selection will, say, fix something in Oshias which exists in Oshias, but of course it could never operate in that in Cenorhabditis because there's nothing to work on. Mm. Do you have any data from environments or the way these species behave which would suggest if either or both of those is possible? My short answer is no. <laughs> so, um, um, and, uh, so do you mean? Do you think that the, mean, the, the, yeah. the what's being fixed, is it being fixed by just by chance so that it's really totally driven by these developmental patterns and you get then genetic drift fixing things in, in small populations? Or do you think there's actually a selective advantage which you've seen in some of these species which is being fixed for, say, vulval traits in Oshias that maybe never could occur in Cenorhabditis? Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, it's an interesting question, but I really don't know how to answer it, actually. I mean, how, I, I don't have the answer, but how I would e experimentally address it, even. Um, but, yeah. Okay. That was uh, inspiring, as usual, Marianne. Thanks. Um, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm, this is, I guess, more of a comment than a question, but I'm really struck by the work that you've done and others that we're going to hear about this meeting, where as we start to learn more about how these worms that are, as you noted, often were thought of as just living in the lab, uh, they have a real environment, they have food they like to eat, they have habitats they have to find reliably, they have pathogens they're fighting off. It seems like we're now at the cusp in the next few years of being able to figure out what the part of the Cenorhabditis genome that doesn't have orthologs to the human genome or the fly genome does. And on the one hand, as an evolutionary biologist, this is incredibly exciting. And even as a kind of functional biologist who's, say, interested in immunology or gene annotation, that's exciting too. But <coughs> many of us are actually driven by the reality that if our favorite gene doesn't have a home log in a mammal, people say, well, who cares about your research program? And so I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this, but <laughs> I, I, <coughs> I, I mean, I think that the human genome must be full of these genes that are idiosyncratic, yet really, really important, too. And so I'm trying to think, is there some kind of meta level in which we can use these taxon-restricted functions in our genomes as a, as a model for how other species must do the same thing? And uh, so I guess I'm just making, ask, encouraging people to think about this, because there's sort of, you know, tight funding. and. There's a real bias out there that if it's, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many papers and grant proposals I've read recently where it's like, we prune from our gene set all the genes that didn't have human homologs. And it's like, ah, I hate that. So anyway, I think your work is, is going to take us somewhere. And I guess I'm curious where that's going to be. So maybe in five years, we'll have this conversation again. So I don't think, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it, so I th I mean, uh, if I remember in yeast, for example, if you change the environment, you can get an effect of every single gene, a strong effect on growth. So this may be something obviously worth to do to take all the bacteria from buck or whatever pathogens I may find and look at the effect for many things. Um, this being said, this may work with 4,000 genes and less or 6,000 and less with 25,000, which may be even, yeah. But Definitely. So I, I guess I have a, a question that is m maybe kind of similar, but it's a somewhat more directed question. Um, do you have you got any data on the particularly say from the mutant accumulation lines yet, whether the where where those random mutations have occurred is in the same genes that have been defined in artificial mutagenesis screens or are they elsewhere in the genome? So if, for example, it's um, Wnt levels that vary, then it could well be, you know, regulatory things way away from the, the genes encoding Wnt homologs. For so example. that's definitely something I dream to do. Um, so D Denver has, has uh, sequenced a few of them. Um, yeah? 
Okay, I missed it, sorry. <laughs> but not all of them yet, right? Oh, uh, yeah, but yeah. So the, the issue is to find those where this actually changes. So, th but I think this is going to be highly multigenic and probably much more than the genes we know by mutagenesis to be part of the immune pathway. Uh, so it may be that you just a little change is affecting the interpretation or something, you know. Yeah, uh, but this is definitely interesting. So in your Oshias uh, EMS mu mutagenesis, did you find any lines that were fi had a fixed variant? Because there, were, there were never any fixed variants in those MA lines. So. Yes, right. Uh, yes, basically yes. Yep. Yeah. We had some. So the the, the reference train I used for Oshias has is almost fixed to two divisions for P4P and P8P, and I got strains where the overwhelming is one. I got an incredibly simple question. Actually, Mark got one. <laughs> what? In, in, Mark used to work on those shares. <laughs> Sorry. I've still got an incredibly simple question, Marion. Yeah. Um, uh, where do the, in going back to your um, orchard in France, where do the worms go in the winter, and, and therefore where do they come back into the apple? And in anticipation of you saying from the soil, but you said you never found them in the soil for years. So where, where are the worms? Okay, uh, I, I don't, I, okay. I get these questions so over the, I mean, uh, it's just difficult. No, <laughs> the problem is that in winter, I, they may be in the soil, but you know, one dower in one ton of soil, and I don't want to pass through one ton of soil to find a dower. Um, and maybe we're completely missing where they are, I don't know. Um, but they may be with, with snails and, you know, whatever. I, uh, it's not fun to sample in the winter. <laughs> 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 no, it's also because they are rarer. It's, it's not fun because you have to sample, you know, 100 times more. You showed those huge aggregates of dowers, yeah. um, sort of resembling fruiting bodies. Do you find multiple species in those, or is there always a single species that it's makes them up? It's a good question. Up? I don't have the answer. I mean, especially elegance versus bruxy. I don't know. 